everyone. Uh, it's great to see you in this space today. Um, I was feeling all kinds of terrible on Monday, but I'm back. Um, and yeah, everything's cool. Um, I'm going to just apologize for the fact that you had to watch a video of me with uh, maybe slightly less awesome hair. Um, but other than that, like the information obviously is like exactly the same. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I figured rather than like falling behind, um, in general, like uh, you know, having like a sick day for me is like a once once a semester thing. So hopefully that was it. Um, I will have one more opportunity to uh, have y'all watch a video in place of being in person here, and that is uh, February 26th. I'm going to be out of town. Um, and so I'll have a video prepared for that day. Um, so in any case, let's just jump in and uh, kind of pick up right where we left off. So um, I am going to spend a little bit of time today kind of uh, reviewing some of the key concepts that we covered um, in the last sort of like 40 minute video. Um, I, you may have actually noticed that I truncated the video a little bit. I cut it off at the end. Um, and that was because I made some changes to the still searching assignment this semester um, that the TAs are going to talk to you about in section. Um, so I didn't want to confuse anybody, so I just chop, chopped it off. <laughs> um, in any case, um, so today we're going to kind of move into Photoshop without really any sort of further delay. And um, we spent a good amount of time last class sort of talking through ideas of pixel size, like what is a raster image versus what is a vector image, um, some of those questions. And today we're really going to see some of that stuff put into, hello, uh, put into practice. Um, so does anybody have any questions before we sort of like jump into Photoshop and start actually working with images? All right. Um, well, that takes care of that. So uh, I've got my YouTube stuff muted here. Um, I just want to kind of like orient you a little bit to what where we're at on the Canvas page. It's something that I try to do every now and then. Um, obviously, there's this uh, assignment that kind of came out on Monday. Um, if anyone has any questions about it, I'm happy to answer those questions in class. Um, like right now. Um, if you have questions about it, of course, you can also talk to the TAs uh, during, your, during your discussion section or your lab section. Um, so yeah. Um, today, I'm going to jump into uh, Photoshop. And we're also going to talk about the sort of second assignment, which is to make a collage. And that collage, um, this semester, I'm doing things a tiny bit differently. Um, it used to be called, if you know somebody who maybe has taken this class before, it used to be called the retro collage. Um, and we're taking a different thematic focus. So this semester we're focusing on the natural world. Um, and when I say that we're having a, like a thematic focus, like is this part of the natural world, this table? You could certainly make an argument that it is. <laughs> um, so we're kind of wide open as far as that stuff goes. If you think it's from the natural world and you can tell us why you think it's part of the natural world, go for it. Um, we're, not sort of com we're not coming up with these thematic uh, angles as a way of excluding. We're coming up with the thematic angles as a way of basically like prompting you if you don't have any ideas, um, which is a problem that sometimes happens. So they're really meant to kind of inspire you. So well, let's go ahead and jump into Photoshop. I have, um, we can certainly create a, a document in Photoshop. I have a couple of um, files that I went ahead and downloaded, similarly to the way that you would download images uh, for the still searching assignment. Um, one of my goals for the still searching assignment is that you can do some of the work for the collage project and potentially other projects in this class um, as part of that assignment. So it's sort of like a pre-assignment where you look for images and then in the collage assignment we're really, just want to make sure, we're, we're actually asking you to do stuff with those images um, that you've saved in folders and you know zip archive and all that. So um, I'm just going to like expand my icons just a tiny bit um, and use the icon preview in Mac OS. Um, and I'll kind of show you what I have going on here. 
So um, when I'm looking through like a large stack of images, I really like this slideshow view, um, just because it kind of gives you like um, a really good view of, you know, all the images in a fairly large format. Um, the other thing you can do in the Mac OS, if you have a lot of images to look for or to look at, is to just um, highlight them and hit the space bar. And then you can page through them using the arrow keys. Um, and that's, you know, another sort of super useful thing called quick look that a lot of people don't realize actually exists. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good thing. Um, so in any case, I have this sort of stack of images, and um, they're from all sorts of different sources. So um, one of the reasons that I do this uh, assignment the way I do is because I, there, there are all sorts of places that you can get images, um, even online. The images may come from different sources. Um, and it's important to kind of realize what those sources have um, or don't have, as the case may be. So this is l actually a screenshot. Um, so as we were talking about uh, resolution a little bit yesterday, uh, anytime you make a screenshot, it's gonna default to 72 DPI. Um, but maybe another, well, actually technically 144, because I'm on a retina screen. Um, so if you're using a Mac, a Mac with a retina screen, it would be 144 resolution. Um, although what you're really looking for when you look for image size is this, uh, dimensions entry, and you can see this in the Mac OS in multiple places. If you're on the Windows OS, all you have to do is right click your, um, right click the file and just go to properties, and this information should come up on Windows as well. Um, so one of the things that I actually like about Mac OS is that you can sort of set it up when you're in this view. It has this sort of sidebar here. In the other views, in the column view, you can also get this sort of sidebar with all this nice important information. Um, you're probably not gonna find this if you use the list view. Um, and I use the list view a lot when I'm just like looking for something and I know what I'm looking for, but if I'm sort of looking at a big stack of images and I want more detail, I would find one of these view modes just to be much more informative. Um, the other way, if you are working in the list view or the icon view, you can also hit command I, and that'll bring up what's called in Mac terms, the info palette. Um, and the info palette, it's basically a little bit more information than you would get in the OS preview, but um, it's usually the OS preview is enough for me, but we do get a lot of important information. You can see right here, we get the pixel size. Um, we get the color space, which is another piece of important information. Um, and then, you know, you'll basically like also see some of the history of the, of the image, which is also important. So that being said, I'm just gonna go through this stack really quickly and kind of explain to you where these images come from. So as I said before, this one is a screenshot. Um, my favorite way to take a screenshot on the Mac OS, by the way, is shift command uh, three. Um, if you Google it, there are lots of other ways to take a screenshot, um, and Windows has kind of its own way. Um, but yeah, I mean, screenshots are, are pretty self-explanatory. Like, the one thing that you're not going to get ever from a screenshot is high resolution. Um, screen, screen captures and screen capture um, graphics are always gonna be the resolution of the screen. I mean, that sounds kind of self-evident, um, but a lot of people don't understand that, you know, even with a retina screen, um, which is like one of the higher quality screens that you can get out there, it's still pretty low resolution. Um, so 144 by 144 is not too special. Um, and you can go like 72, 96, 144, those are all really common screen resolutions. Um, if I want to pick another image here, um, this is an image that I know for a fact was created in a very different way. Um, this image was created using um, professional scanning equipment by a library. So this image, and we can also see by looking at the file size, this image is 802K because it's only like 1500 by 1100 pixels. And this image is a totally different story. This is. 42 by 5,900 pixels. Um, so it's huge, it's like five or six times the size. Um, and the resolution is at a very, very common high resolution. 
uh, which is uh, 300 DPI. So if you're looking at sources that you're thinking about making prints of or even thinking about a source where you have like a lot of zoom capability, which I really like for cameras, um, you would potentially want to look for higher, higher pixel count images, um, which inherently could be higher resolution. So uh, another image that is probably going to be from its source is going to be fairly familiar to you. Um, this is an image that came straight off my Canon camera. And um, you can see if, you know, everyone, I'm just going to quick make a sort of technical change um, here. I think I told you last semester I had to get glasses. And it's not super fun to teach when I can't see. So I'm going to, there we go, make it a little more comfortable. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> um, so anyway, you can see this one has a, a 72 by 72 resolution. So it's a screen, a screen resolution. But it's not maybe really accurate to say that it's a low, low resolution image because it really has quite a few pixels in it, right? So all this to say, and this is a review from kind of the video, that what really matters is the pixel size. Um, the pixel size is really the only thing that matters. Um, and just to kind of like get this sort of, we're going to open this up in Photoshop and I'm going to do a few things to it. So let's go. Um, and today in general, we're going to be kind of chunking through some of the very basic basics of Photoshop. Um, and I think pretty much the next three classes are devoted to Photoshop. Um, and sort of working with still images in Photoshop specifically. So, so here's my image. I've opened it up in Photoshop. Um, it's a TIFF image, which is you know, kind of immaterial at this point. It doesn't really matter that it's a TIFF image. Um, let me go ahead and you can see down here in the status bar, it gives you like a little preview of what the pixel size is and also how the resolution is set. But if you want to really play around with this stuff or uh, adjust it, you should go to the image size function under the image tab. And within the image size function, you can certainly adjust things like the resolution. So right now, there's this evil box. And I'm saying evil in a somewhat tongue-in-cheek way. But um, resampling in digital media with images, it sounds cool. Like it sounds like something that you would hear in like a hip hop album, right? But it's totally not. Um, resampling is basically making up pixels <laughs> that aren't there. Um, so I'm going to actually turn off resampling. And you can see what happens when I adjust the resolution. Right now, I'm saying, OK, don't resample, which basically means work with the pixels you have. And if I turn this number of the resolution up to like 300, um, you can see that it took my image and it made it smaller, right? And that's because resolution is relative to the, the pixels, right? So just to kind of like, I'm going to cancel out of that and do that again. Basically showing you. Uh, in a second here. So this is 78 inches by 52 inches at 300 DPI. So let's say what would happen if I cut it in half size-wise. Um, I could maybe make it like 26 inches. And then I actually probably need to not click that resample button ahead of my adjustment, which would have been nice. So I'm going to unclick resample. And I'll make this 26 inches, which is half. And you can see that basically the resolution doubled, right? Because it's taken those same number of pixels. And it's just said, OK, well, then the, t the pixels are twice as dense, right? There's twice as many within an inch. Now, if you wanted to take this image, um, I'm just canceling out of it and redoing it because I need to kind of start from scratch every time. Um, if I wanted to take this image and I wanted to make it twice as big, like. And by twice as big, I don't mean twice as many inches by inches. I mean twice as many pixels. 
I could potentially use this resample function and go to like 144, which would be double. And so a couple of things have happened here. One is that you probably will notice that there's a significant dip in quality. In other words, this is not as clear, right? Um, the other thing that has happened is that my image has gone from being like five, 4,000 pixels by 5,000 pixels, now it's 11,000 pixels by 7,000 pixels. And up here, this is the really important part, our image was 120 megabytes, and now our image is like 481 megabytes, which that's kind of like right on the threshold of like stuff that I don't really want to download because it's going to take too long, um, depending on how great your internet access is. I know there are some really fast uh, internet access here on campus, but um, you know, in general, like that gets to be a bit much. So, so resampling can definitely lead to a lack of quality. I mean, one thing I want to do is I'm going to take some of these detail areas of the image and I'm just going to show you how kind of resampling can go wrong. Um, so here you can see it's like a fairly sharp, well-focused fo well image. Um, I'm going to do something that I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing at home, which is I'm going to add a ton of resolution to this. Um, so in other words, I'm going to make this like a really gigantic file. It might actually slow down my computer quite a bit because I'm taking a file that was 120 megabytes and I'm making it 22 gigs, which is like, you know, a couple orders of magnitude larger. Um, in fact, I'm just going to use 800 here because I don't want my computer to lock up in the middle of lecture. So it's going to take a second because that's a lot of pixels to invent. Beach ball in. Okay, so now here we are back with our sort of same area of the screen. And it's going to take me a second because it's running pretty slow. Um, it's going to take a second for me to kind of get zoomed in here. I think I want to be somewhere over here. It'll just take a second to process it. This, this is like, um, why would you ever want to make an image this large? Um, pretty much the only reason you would ever want to make an image this large is if you're making a gigantic print, um, which is totally a thing that artists do, right? Um, but I think you can probably even see just from looking at this section that you don't, the image doesn't necessarily get better um, as you add those pixels in. It just gets like, see how some of the shadows are like blocky? Um, so the image, when you add pixels to an image, it's doing it algorithmically. And we all know that algorithms are really awesome. I mean, I met my partner because of an algorithm. Um, but in this case, like algorithms are, yeah, <laughs> algorithms are maybe not that useful because they have a tendency to look kind of fake. Um, and that's what you start to get when you sort of um, basically like invent pixels that aren't there is they start to have this sort of like look of being computer generated. Um, so I'm going to sort of control Z out of this or command Z, of course, if you're on the Mac. Um, yeah, so sometimes it's better just to like leave well enough alone when it comes to images. But I guess the other lesson there is that um, it's really, really difficult to synthesize pixels that aren't there, even if you're using AI. Um, and not that I'm like, I'm totally not anti-AI tools or anything, but did you have a question? Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, I'm not anti-AI tools at all, but like there is a certain look that the, those images have and they do look kind of processed or kind of, you know, fake. <laughs> fake is a good word. Um, but yeah, so, okay, so let me roll a couple more images in here. Um, 
most of the image-based assignments in this class, in fact, almost all of them, ask you to start with a canvas and then import images into the canvas. So if I wanted to create a canvas, like for my first project here, I would go to New, File New, and um, you may, uh, of course, you can just enter in all the values for the assignment requirements over here, but uh, I actually made it easy for you. If you go over to the print preset, um, there is a letter size preset that you can select. And your choice here is landscape or portrait. Don't forget that you do have a choice. <laughs> um, and you can use the landscape mode. Um, so don't forget that that's there. In fact, I think I'm going to use the landscape mode for this demo. So I can go ahead and create that. And um, basically what this is, is this is like an empty repository for your, for your images that you might work with. And one of the reasons that we're making this the way we're making it, if I go to image size, is that it's got the sort of exact size that we need that's demanded by the assignment. Um, it's a really common question that I get from students, like, why do you ask for everything to be a specific size? Um, and I guess I'll just say that I have been an arts professional for you know, almost 20 years, and every single time I have to submit an image for you know, press or for uh, getting a show or like anything related to my professional life, there is always a size requirement <laughs> with um, you know, resolution, pixel size, all this stuff. Um, so it's, it actually is kind of important and it does matter. Um, so in any case, we're sort of making it letter size at 300 dpi. And you can verify that in the image size function if you forget. Um, probably the next thing that I would do is go ahead and open up some other images. So I happen to have some images uh, loaded into this folder. And um, hey, that's the natural world. I think I'll go maybe this one. I have this uh, great jellyfish image. I have this image of cats falling down in a rainstorm. I'm going to say that that is the natural world, even though it's technically synthetic, but cats, they're an animal. So, and then um, we also have this image of jellyfish. Um, so that should be enough for us to play with today. So there um, is this sort of idea when, when you're collaging that you need to basically like bring all the images into this workspace. And there's a, f just, if we haven't sort of like explored for Photoshop at all, if you're completely new to Photoshop, um, I guess I can warn you in advance that there's like 50 million ways to do every single thing in Photoshop. So I'm gonna show you how I like to do things. If you see a different way or, you know, somebody shows you a different way, it's probably fine. It's probably great. Um, but this is how I like to do it. So. Um, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do a select all and then I'm going to copy and then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to paste it. Now, a couple of things you may notice. One is that this image filled up the canvas here. It did not fill up the canvas here. Um, that's probably because the canvas was the exact same size as the image, which is kind of how it works. This image is actually only 2100 by 1400 pixels. And if we look at the sort of pixel size of this whole thing, it's 3300 by 2550. So it was smaller. So it pasted it in as smaller because Photoshop in general wants to preserve the resolution of whatever's there. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. Um, and then I'm gonna show you yet another way of bringing an image into another image in Photoshop. So this is potentially like the way that I use a little more often, and that is that I go to my image, I drag this background layer, kind of click and drag, I wake up the image, so get it to switch over by hovering the tab, and then just drop it. Um, now, you might be asking yourself, um, that's cool, but it looks like exactly the same. Um, it does look exactly the same. The, the advantage to doing it this way is that if you do certain things to it um, in here, 
it will retain like those extra layers. So there are certain things that Photoshop, like masking or adjustments or things like that. And so I'll show you how that works as we kind of move along today. Um, but those are basically the two ways that you can bring information back and forth to files. Um, another way, which is not a terrible way, but it's not a way that I ever do, um, is to actually place embedded um, or place linked. Um, and then it just is sort of like importing that file. I stay away from both of those um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, place linked actually turns Photoshop into another, another app called InDesign. Um, and you're not sort of like really working with the pixels, you're working with a link to a file. So that's kind of lame. Um, and then place embedded is really just a different way of doing what we're already doing. So um, yeah, I just think that that's kind of weird. So now, once we get to this point, I'm gonna go ahead and work on my third image back here. And a goal for collaging these images together, like a reasonable goal, would be to start by potentially removing the background from the image. Now, I will tell you that these images have varying levels of difficulty uh, for that to happen. This image and this image, removing the background will be quite difficult um, because this image in particular, all of this like subtle stuff right here is kind of on nightmare level for background extraction. Um, same thing over here. This kind of stuff where it's soft and flowy and it goes from one tone to another, nightmare level. Um, but we can do it. We'll, we'll try, we'll give it a shot and see how it goes. This image, however, this image is like the easiest image I have ever seen. Um, why? Because it has a solid color. Um, and pretty much any time, you might know this intuitively just from working with apps on your phone, um, if you put somebody in front of a white background and then you do like a background replacement filter or something like that, it's probably gonna work really well, right? Where if you put them in front of that, <laughs> it's not gonna work very well because the algorithm doesn't understand the difference, right? Um, an algorithm doesn't know what background or foreground is. It has to kind of like understand that by saying, oh, there's this giant expanse of color. So, all right, so let's do this one. This one's gonna be really easy. Um, so my sort of first take for removing something from the background is to use what's called the magic wand tool. And um, you may notice that I have three uh, sort of selection tools here. There's the object selection tool, the quick selection tool, and the magic wand tool. They're all fine. Um, personally, I love the magic wand tool. Um, I also think the quick selection tool and the object selection tool are super useful, um, but I'm gonna use the magic wand tool because it's the most straightforward. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click a point on here. Well, that was awesome. That did pretty much exactly what I wanted it to do. Um, except one thing about the magic wand tool and in general all the selection tools or at least the uh, sort of algorithmic selection tools in Photoshop, is that they sort of are programmed to look for the nearest neighbor. So that's one of the ways that Photoshop works, like on, from an algorithm's perspective. You're always sort of saying, okay, like I'm here, I'm gonna find a pink pixel and a pink pixel here, and then I'm gonna find these two pink pixels, and then I'm gonna find what are next to them. But if you have areas where there's a barrier in between the pink pixels, it's gonna basically not find those pixels because they're not next to another pink pixel. Um, so there's a real easy way to get around that and that is to go up here to the select menu. This has all of the sort of things that you can do after you make a selection, which is super powerful because um, usually just using one of these selection tools almost always you have to do some work on it after the fact. It doesn't just kind of work out of the box. So I can come in here and just use this similar function and it will basically highlight all the pink pixels. Um, so that's like super, super useful. Now, 
you might be saying, oh, cool, well, that's it, right? You, you're done, I did all the work, I can bring it into my other collage. Well, not quite. Um, making a selection is really just like letting Photoshop know in advance of doing something what you wanna do something to. It's not like the thing itself, right? A do, making a selection doesn't really do anything. Um, you're just identifying areas that you want to have something happen to. So here, um, if I go to the layer palette, we can make what's called a layer mask. And so in this case, in this case, I actually, uh, I always, I'm not, I don't think I'm dyslexic, but like for real, but um, I always have to like seriously um, kind of think about this really hard because the binary of like on off, I just always, I always mix it up and I don't know why. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna walk you through it like I'm you. Uh, I definitely selected the pink pixels, okay? So if I selected the pink pixels and I wanna get rid of the background, that means I need to hide the selection. <laughs> get that wrong every single time. Um, now, there are some, a couple of little issues that we might wanna talk about at, kind of in, as we get into more advanced topics. Um, and one of those issues is that I actually used a pink light source when I made all these cats. So there's some disco lighting that, you know, it's kind of in a gray, no pun intended, kind of a gray area. Um, but, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, it doesn't really matter. Um, and you can see that basically this is like, um, I'm getting into the pixels right now. If I kind of zoom to a point where I can't see the pixels, which would be exactly like 100%. Um, you can see that that is a super clean, super effective, uh, super effective, um, what's the selection process. So now here's where the sort of moving thing gets interesting. So now I'm gonna take this layer. You can see here it has a, a layer mask that we just added to it. And now I can drag that thing with the layer mask into my file and it's like, hello, I can't have layer mask. Um, and it has all of the sort of um, things that you would expect, right? Um, so pretty much any like layer modifications, which we'll get into the, there's a bunch of them that you can do. But when you, when you move the layer through a file, you'll retain, you'll retain all of the Photoshop magic. Um, and when you're cutting and pasting, it's really just gonna move the raw pixels. So sometimes you want one and not the other, but it's important to kind of realize the difference. So <coughs> I'm gonna show you a couple of other things that we can do to maybe make this an even more awesome selection. Um, so one thing is if I go back to the point where we sort of have all the pink stuff selected, um, there's another function that I wanna show you under the select menu. And that is basically the modify function. Um, so one of the things about selections in Photoshop, and I learned this the hard way by having to work for, a, uh, arch I worked for an architectural photographer when I was in college, and at my job, my entire job, was to remove like light panels and electrical conduit, and I basically would like make the room look really nice, you know, um, by taking out all the <laughs> visual distractions. Um, and so when you're working with things like architecture, the actually getting something out of, like this post right here, that would be extremely difficult to Photoshop out. And the reason it would be extremely difficult to Photoshop out is because you can kind of see that gentle shadow that's arcing up the wall. That gentle shadow is saying like, I'm your nightmare. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, that stuff is like really hard to kind of deal with in Photoshop. Like you have to actually put some artistry into it. Um, but one of the ways that you can kind of deal with that is by playing around with the selection and making the selection a little bit different. So there is a thing that you can do. All of these methods are really interesting. Um, I wanna talk about the feather method because the feather method is something that can be super useful if you want to maybe like take that sort of white wall and like fuzz it out so it looks less obvious, right? 
But if I were sort of standing in front of a white wall and somebody put a feather around me as a person, you would be like, wow, like Meg just got like revived from the dead and she's like a spirit now. Um, because, you know, I would literally be glowing. Um, so the feather is something that can be really useful, but it can also be really terrible in the wrong context. So I'll show you. If I put a five pixel feather here on this selection, um, you can see it's kind of like eaten away at some of the detail. Again, that could be a really good thing if you wanted it to do that. Um, but in this case, it's probably not the best choice. So I'm just gonna actually delete the pixels um, that we have selected. And you can sort of see super clearly what that feather did. So, so if you're dealing with a situation where you have to blend things that are really subtle, like a white wall, feather could be awesome. Um, if you're dealing with things where you really want an edge to be sharp or you want something to sort of like not look like it's ethereal and kind of, you know, glowy, um, then stay away from the feather. The ones, um, the operations in that menu that I tend to use the most are probably the expand and contract. So um, let me show you how those work. So um, for example, contract here um, is probably a good method to use. So in general, these um, selection modification things are gonna be specified in terms of pixels. And you kind of have to just like think about the pixel size of your image, which in this case is like a thousand by a thousand, or well, 2000 by a thousand roughly. Um, so here, if I were to put a one pixel contraction on this, it would look, it would be not crazy, right? I mean, that was not crazy at all. Like, um, what would I do if I wanted to actually have it be a little bit more, um, substantial, I could give it a 10 pixel uh, contraction and here we'll really see it. Generally speaking, in most of these, I mean you can do some really interesting things just aesthetically too, um, but generally speaking with these sort of selection modification operations, I try to stay under like two pixels because otherwise it's just like that. <laughs> right, um, which is nowhere near sort of like the subtlety that you're looking for. Um, but I'm a huge fan also of just like misusing tools. So I would um, be a sort of, you know, put in, a, put in a, a really interesting number and see what happens. You know, sometimes you can get interesting effects like the one I just got. Was not expecting that at all. Um, so let's talk about some other techniques for removing things from the background. So this is gonna be, this image is gonna be super hard. Um, now, because it's super hard, does that mean we should not do it? Of course not. Um, probably the first thing that I would do is to try to select this blue color kind of in its, um, in its uh, sort of pure form here with the magic wand tool. And so that did pretty much what I expected it to do um, in that it didn't sort of migrate to other areas because it's really dense and there's a lot of stuff in the way. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can hit the, um, the shift key and the shift key is gonna put your selection tool, which you can see up here, it's gonna toggle it into additive mode, which means that you're basically adding to your selection as you, as you use the tool. Um, do I really want to like click through this ad nauseum for like 100 hours? No. Um, so there's probably a better way to do it, right? Rather than just sitting there and clicking like a million times. Um, so probably what I would do for an image like this is I would actually use what's called the color range selection. Um, and you can find that under the select menu. It's right here, it's called color range. Um, I'm gonna actually deselect uh, before I use the color range because I wanna go in fresh. Um, otherwise, if I go in with a selection, it will sort of 
confine my activity to that selection. So here I'm going to go to, let's say, color range. So color range is a way that you can select things in Photoshop without having to deal with any of the magic wand tools or object selection tools. And basically what you do is you select a color and then you have this fuzziness kind of operator here um, that basically just lets you have um, more or less stuff. Um, and you get a little preview of the selection. So I'm gonna go ahead and just go with that. Um, and you can see that did like way more than the magic wand tool would have ever done. Um, so it can be a really useful tool. Um, I'm gonna show you how to, real quick, we'll just make a layer mask. So in this case, I wanna hide the selection again. It didn't get rid of everything, but what I find the color range tool to be really good for is when you want something and you think you might wanna blend it. So let me drag this over here and I'll show you what I had in mind here. So here, um, derp. okay. Um, now, this is like probably a problem that you might have because uh, I'm basically at this point like wanting to move stuff around, but I have the selection tool enabled. So pretty much like the most important tool in Photoshop even more important than the selection tools, is the move tool. Um, the move tool, you can also hit V on your keyboard and get to it. And the move tool is basically like the kind of, I don't wanna mess things up too badly. I might have, um, you know, it's sort of the good default tool for just doing everything else. Um, but you can see basically that like with this, image, it's certainly not sort of gonna blend against a white background because that you know blue will really stand out. But one of the things that we need to think about when we're combining images is like what's underneath the image. And if what's underneath the image is similar in tone and color than the image, it's gonna blend really well. Um, and if, if you put this over, for example, the white, you can see here it's like, wow, that's not so great, right? So it's a little bit about like the art of the possible um, with this kind of stuff. And then uh, another thing that you definitely wanna kind of be conscious of is that when you have a selection like back here, um, what does the selection really mean? Well, as I said before, a selection is a, a way of kind of marking out territory or marking out image area that you can then do stuff to. So in this case, I have the pink area selected. So I could take a brush tool and I could do terrible things to the pink area, but obviously not to the cats, right? Pretty much any tool in Photoshop, uh, filters, all of those sort of tools in Photoshop, if you have a selection active, those tools will only apply to the selection. Now, if we wanted to sort of mix this up a little bit, we could invert the selection. And then I'm gonna be in a situation where I'm drawing on cats and not on the pink stuff, right? Cat butt. Um, yeah, so, so that's like another kind of important function that selections have. Um, another fun thing that you can do is you can actually um, save a selection. I'm a huge fan of saving selections and definitely when I was working with Photoshop professionally, I would always save my selections because if you don't save your selection and you did a lot of work to get it just right, you're basically throwing away your time, <laughs> right? So um, let's pretend that I spent a lot of time on this, this selection and that I really want to save it for later. You can just click save and then um, you can give it a name And then you basically go up here to load selection and you can load it back again. So I'm gonna, just to make that clear, I'll deselect and then load, load the selection. And you basically make a new selection out of it. 
And why would you want to take such liberties with a selection? Well, probably because you know you can do stuff like that. Um, you can actually like move the selection around. You can scale it. Well, let's do it. So you can actually transform a selection once you already have it made. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here. So I could make like not that I really want to, but I could make um, squishy cats. Um, I was actually hoping to do it non-uniformly, so they would be like crunchy, squishy cats. There we go. Um, and then I can basically get in here, and um, I'm just kind of clearing the area right now, which is basically deleting the area, just to illustrate what it looks like. Um, I w don't normally use the clear function that often. I would, if I were sort of doing this for, for reals, I would make a, a layer mask, which I already showed you. So, so yeah, I mean, using selections, I think it's like really interesting to sort of think about how selections can be used outside of their original context of speaking about it creatively. Um, I mean, there's not really maybe that much create in terms of like human creativity of like removing uh, the background from an object, right? But if you can take the outline of that object and do something else with it or, you know, really think about how you can push your creativity within that context. Um, you can do a ton with selections. Um, I would actually argue that selections are the fundamental, like, learning unit of Photoshop, um, and that selections really control the way Photoshop works. Um, so I don't want to overload you. Let me consult with my little list here. Do, do, do. Okay, so there's one more thing that I wanted to show you, and it looks like I have, uh, well, maybe one second. Um, I can definitely uh, finish on time today, don't worry. <laughs> um, but uh, what would be the one other thing that I wanted to show you so that you can have some fun? Uh, well, that thing would be layer blending modes. So. Um, I'm gonna take this top image right here and I'm just gonna show you super quickly how to use the layer blending modes. They're down here on the layers palette. There's like 30 of them and uh, you can just look through the whole stack and think about how they blend. Um, but that's another like super kind of foundational way of making things happen in Photoshop is using these blending modes. Um, so I can stop here for today, and um, we uh, will be back on Monday for more Photoshop-ins. <laughs>